Um, so this is Catherine, Dr. Catherine Anderson, um, a uh, former associate of mine from grad school, mm -hmm. actually, and I thought she would be um, a great speaker for the National Museum of Language. Uh, she is an assistant professor of English at Western Washington University, uh, that's in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, her work has appeared in Victorian Review and the edited collection Traumatic Tales, British Nationhood and National Trauma in 19th Century Literature, and she has also written for public books. Um, she's currently at work on a book manuscript entitled Twisted Words, Torture and Liberalism in Imperial in Britain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, without further ado, I'll turn the yeah. over. To Hello, everyone. I feel like we're small enough that I could know everyone's name and that'd be okay. But I want to say thanks um, to the museum, to Greg, Jill, Linda, and Pat, right, as well as Shannon for bringing me in. Um, I'm excited to be here, and it's been just a really beautiful weekend. Like, it's nice to be here in the spring, see some cherry blossoms. So, thank you all. Um, and as Shannon said, I'm at work at a book, on a book right now that's looking at the ways in which torture as a tool of the state kind of evolved and got thought about in the 19th century in Britain. And so this talk comes from that project. Um, and it's going to be looking at what happened in British India um, when they wanted people to pay taxes and tortured them to get that money um, out. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get started. This is a map of uh, where everything went down. So it's the southern part of India where, where this took place. Um, in the 1850s. And so um, in 1856, a London newspaper, The Examiner, insisted that wherever there are Europeans, no matter whether those Europeans are officials, merchants, or missionaries, there's certainly no torture. So the newspaper is making a claim that basically supports the three-part rationale for the British Empire. The spread of liberal government, the officials, the spread of global capitalism, the merchants, and the spread of Christian religion the missionaries. Um, and so the newspaper suggests that whenever there's a British person who's part of that system present, he can prevent the barbaric tortures that may have taken place under previous regimes or previous forms of government. Um, but the newspaper only made that defensive statement because a recent government report had suggested that the opposite was true, that Indian subjects were being tortured um, under British rule. So in 1854, several members of parliament had made a claim that the tax officials in the Madras presidency, um, which is here on the slide, um, you can see, um, had resorted to torture while collecting the British land tax from local peasants. So the British government sent three commissioners um, to determine the truth of the accusations. So they interviewed alleged victims and witnesses for three months. They sifted through a bunch of written evidence. And at the end of all that, they decided that the accusations had been based on fact. And they published a report in 1855. Very long title, Report of the Commissioners for the Investigation of Alleged Cases of Torture in Madras. Um, they liked long titles. But the scandal and the investigation ended up sparking a very heated debate in Britain itself about what could actually count as torture, right? Um, and just as a kind of side note, one of the common sayings about torture, because it is kind of hard to define and pin down, is that like pornography, you know it when you see it, right? Um, that's a more contemporary saying, but <laughs> in the 19th century, the, you know, the whole point of this talk is that they were struggling with that. Like, how do we define this word and this practice? Um, so today I want to discuss uh, how we can think about this moment, this 19th century torture scandal, um, as a moment that helps us redefine the liberal Western definition of torture. Um, as a word, as a practice, um, it's a moment that helps initiate a modern understanding of torture and the forms that it can take, very different from the past. So as a result of the scandal, the British broke with their national history, and they updated it with this more modern understanding of torture that as a, something that could be an everyday and systemic interaction between citizen subjects and their government. Um, and the British complicity in these more modern acts of torture also underlined the indeterminate civic status of the Indian subjects of the empire. Um, the torture scandal crystallizes colonial modernity as a moment in which you get these practices of violence in the colonial space that end up melding with the contemporary bureaucracies of the British colonizer. And that's how we end up getting this modern definition um, in the West. And it troubles the distinction um, for a liberal government between a subject and a citizen. So, oops. Um, here I have a little breakdown for you of sort of the different aspects that I'm going to discuss. 
Um, I'm going to begin with a really quick definition of a couple of terms, a state of exception and a state of emergency. Um, and these are terms that often get used to discuss any kind of government sanctioned torture or a form of government terrorism where the government is trying to control people um, or, or sort of settle things down. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between um, what torture looked like in British history and kind of what they imagined when they heard the word at the time, and then how that gets updated in their modern present, right? Like what happens in India that's different, that they don't recognize, and how that shifts the viewpoints for them. And then I'm going to give a few takeaways about, um, you know, what these updated forms and what the updated a definition of torture can tell us um, about medicine, about uh, medical evidence versus victim narration, and kind of how uh, that underwent a little bit of a switch, um, and about human rights and citizenship um, at this particular moment in the 19th century. So first of all, the state of exception. Um, and in Britain's past, torture had been a special prerogative for the sovereign. Um, the sovereign and his privy council would decide on it. It took place outside of the kind of normal and regular laws that everybody else was subject to. Um, and it emerged primarily in relation to what we would now call a state of exception. So political theorist Carl Schmitt defines the state of exception as a state of extreme peril. The sovereign says, you know, the state is in danger. Because the state is in danger, that justifies that we have to do whatever it is that we have to do to get things back under control, right? Um, that might mean. In our contemporary context, something like martial law would be a good example. Um, in the historical past for Britain, often that meant torturing someone who, who was seen as a threat or a treason um, in some way, not just to sort of punish that person, but also to serve as a kind of example for everybody else. You know, you don't want to do this because if you do, you will be tortured as well. Um, so typically in the past, the state of exception gets used to reassert sovereign power um, when it looks like someone has, you know, done something against the, threat, the sovereign or threatened treason in some way. Um, as you move into the 18th century, sovereign power starts to get curtailed a little bit, parliament starts playing a bigger role in government, um, and the monarch is no longer allowed to stand above the law and kind of make these unilateral decisions. At the same time, you get the emergence of liberalism. And of course, classical liberalism is all about the idea of, you know, liberty and equality for people um, as individual subjects. Um, and it's pretty hard for an individual subject to have that freedom if they're subject to the whim of someone who might torture them, right? Um, but it was complicated in that uh, a lot of 19th century political philosophers kept thinking about this question, right? Like, what do we do about violence and about kind of the power of the sovereign as we're moving to a more liberal place? So even John Stuart Mill, who was a very famous spokesperson for liberalism in the 19th century um, and a fierce champion of human rights in a number of contexts, said that, you know, it's okay to have vigorous despotism if the ends justify the means. Essentially, if your goal is to further civilization and sometimes you need to do something that's a little rough to get there, it's still for the good of the people, so it's probably okay, right? That happened a lot in the colonial context, um, this idea that uh, violence and um, could be used as a tool to sort of help people reach real civilization, right? To sort of root out the things that were happening that uh, didn't relate to modernity or looked backward in some way. Okay, so that's the state of exception. Um, the term the state of emergency is somewhat similar um, in that it also gets at this idea that there's danger threatening the state um, and there are sometimes needs to be extreme measures to get that back um, under control. But um, a lot of people use these two terms interchangeably. Um, a, legal, a legal scholar called Nasser Hussein argues that the state of emergency gives you a little bit more elasticity, so it's a more useful term. Um, in that it can cover treason in the same way that state of exception does, but it can also cover other things that aren't treason that also threaten the state. So in this case, um, I typically tend to use the term state of emergency to talk about what happened in India because it wasn't treason, but because people weren't paying their taxes, it did threaten the state, right? Like there was no money that they could use to keep themselves going and kind of um, ensure stability. So um, the state of emergency kind of works better as a term to, to situate why the state felt threatened and sort of why all of this was happening at this moment when peasants could not pay the high taxes that they were being asked um, to pay. Okay. And again, um, it's important there to remember that a justification for this kind of behavior for the British would have been we're bringing them freedom and liberty and justice. That is what this money goes to do. So we need the money to do that, right? The kind of Western justification for um, any kind of imperialism really falls um, under that category. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about what the British thought about when they thought about torture um, in the 19th century. Um, 
because I kept thinking about medieval times and sort of the practice of torture that gets linked to tyrannical power, as I said, and how that stood in opposition to those post-enlightenment values that they were really clinging to. Um, you know, this idea of reason and the individual subject um, and a kind of suspicion of the, the sorts of power that would produce torture. Um, so many liberal or many Victorians didn't really think about themselves as political liberals, but they were on board with this idea that, um, you know, people should be free from illegitimate means of authority. And if it helps their moral and spiritual growth, that's also great too. Um, if that's the liberal project, even though I don't see myself as a liberal, I'm on board with it. Sounds great. Let's do it, right? Like send the missionaries, send the merchants, do it all. Um, and of course, if you're living under the fear of torture, again, you're not gonna be able to have that kind of autonomy and that kind of freedom. So at this moment in the 19th century, Britain starts to position itself as a champion of those values, as a champion of the kinds of values that would protect people from being tortured in other nations like Russia. Um, I don't know that things are much different now, right? Like in the, in the way that we categorize these nations, but um, they could kind of feel smug about themselves because they were at this point where they were highly civilized and they treated people with respect. And, you know, um, torture was just the complete opposite of that and a kind of something that they could point to and be like, we've modernized, we're civilized, we're better than this. So before this torture scandal happened, the collective British memory assumes that um, in order for a practice to count as torture, it has to conform to very specific criteria. There has to be a deliberate and an official sanction from the government or from the ruler. Um, and there has to be a kind of ritualistic procedure that uses recognizable official instruments like the rack in an attempt to get the person who's being tortured to confess verbally and therefore to reassert sovereign power. So up here, you can see an example of one of those specific instruments that would have been something that would come to mind for them when they were thinking about the word torture. This is the rack. Um, and as you can see, and probably already knew, because I think this is a pretty familiar instrument even today, um, when we think about torture, uh, you basically, you tie the four limbs to the four points, and when you turn those cranks, it pulls the person apart, right, like in four different directions. Um, so it's a very specific instrument. That's the only thing it does, right? It's there to pull someone apart. It, you can't really use it to do anything else. It's a technology of torture that's been designed to do that work. Um, so political scientist Darius Rajali, who is a specialist on torture, argues that every nation produces their own folklore of torture um, in which they have these pre-constructed and nationally shared memories. Um, and they take those memories for granted as uh, what patterns of torture actually look like. Um, so in the 19th century, Britain had this. They had a folklore um, that was culturally shared. It was pre-constructed, um, a memory about what torture was supposed to look like in relation to their own past. The rack was part of that. Um, and when these allegations of torture in India surfaced, they returned to this folklore as they tried to understand what it was that was happening in India. So the Glasgow Herald, wrote an article and they said, we know that torture was once a part of our judicial system. The obstinate criminal and the confirmed heretic were subjected to the rack. Therefore, the word torture suggests to the English mind a deliberate judicial sanction to degrading and absurd cruelties. So here you have a writer who's insisting that if we're gonna think about this as torture, if it's a practice that's gonna count as torture, it has to conform to this familiar ritual. It has to conform to what we know. Torture is traditionally linked to the idea of revealing truth through coerced confession. And so the newspaper is kind of reminding its readers of that history and the idea that criminals and heretics are the people who get tortured um, because they threaten sovereign authority. And when they're forced to confess under torture, that reasserts the sovereign authority properly. No, they had given up, I think, uh, let me see. Probably the 1600s was the last time any form of torture uh, as such had been done. They still did like public executions up until the 19th century, but they saw those as slightly different than torture. Yeah, and they did too. And that was one way that they could help distance themselves and say, we're so modern, we're so civilized, right? Like we don't do these things anymore. We used to. The Inquisition was a big, uh, they always turned kind of back to the Inquisition as a time when this would happen. Yeah. Um, so in the report, and I've given you uh, this little excerpt here from the report that the commissioners wrote, um, and the report uh, was excerpted widely in a lot of the newspapers in Britain. Um, they just took whole chunks of it and like put it in their articles. And in this report, the commissioners acknowledge that there's this debate, right, over torture, um, but they end up giving the readers a more modern definition to consider based on what they saw happening in India. 
So as you can see here on the slide or on the slide behind me, um, they assert that although the word torture probably evokes ideas of the Inquisition, the thumb screws, the rack, and the wheel for some readers, um, and that those readers would probably think it's the wrong term for what's happening in India. It's a little excessive, right? Um, still, it becomes a legitimate definition of what had occurred. And so to help make this case um, that the word torture was still appropriate for what had happened in India, they turned to Johnson's dictionary, as one does, right? Like when you're trying to define something. And uh, the dictionary defines torture as pain by which guilt is punished or confession is extorted. So the commissioners said, you know, if we're using this definition that's in the dictionary of what torture is, what happened in India conforms to that definition. But they didn't just stop there. They also added to the dictionary definition. And they said, we're going to add um, you know, money to the list of things that you can extort from, tor from torture, like use torture to get from people. It's not just confession. It's not just um, punishing guilt. You can get money from them. So the report itself ends up facilitating this debate about the very meaning of the word torture, because right in the report, it gives these two different forms that it could take, right? The sort of traditional form that gets linked to sovereign power in this history, um, and the very specific instruments like the rack um, from the past, and then this more abstract dictionary definition from Johnson, which eventually could and would be applied with greater liberality to all kinds of stuff that was happening in the remainder of the 19th century. Um, from this point, moment in time, as, as the century progresses, they end up start thinking about psychological torture as something that could actually happen as well um, in marriages when you're thinking about cruelty um, and all these kind of new ways. So this is a kind of moment that cracks that open um, for them. Okay, so the fact that this is really new is actually one of the strongest arguments for the people who were like, no, this isn't torture. Oops. Um, so the Calcutta Review, which was a, a periodical in India, it was a, an English newspaper published in Calcutta that gets quoted in the British press all the time. They were like, this is a perverted use of the word torture. Um, it's only by employing language in a new sense that we can even think about torture and the collection of revenue together, right? It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, hi. <laughs> So as the legal practice of torture evolves in the colonial context, the word itself begins to evolve in the English language as well at this moment. And by redefining the word torture in relation to money, um, this scandal begins to question the morality of the British Empire in a new way. It suggests that these acts of atrocity um, can be committed as a kind of unremarkable part of everyday government bureaucracy, instead of as a kind of big spectacle um, of power in the way that it would have been in the past. Um, so in British India, you've got, as I said, it's, it moves from a spectacle to this kind of bureaucratic procedure committed by tax collectors. Um, and the people who were in charge of the torture, the Indian officials who were supposed to be collecting money, saw this as a way to complete their daily tasks, right? To do their job. Their job was to collect money. Um, and if they didn't, you know, they weren't doing their professional job and they could be fired, essentially. So for them, it was all about how do I, I have a quota, an amount of money that I have to get for taxes for every you know, quarter, every year or whatever. Nobody's paying it. How am I going to collect that? Because if I don't collect it, I'm going to be blamed um, and I'm going to be fired. So torture in India serves as a kind of early example of what Hannah Arendt would call the banality of evil after uh, the Holocaust and after the Eichmann trials in Jerusalem. Um, and it's just this idea that you can have somebody who's just going about doing their everyday job, just living their everyday life, and by doing that everyday job, by following the directions that they've been given, um, they can actually help commit atrocities, right? And then when it's over, they can be like, well, I was just doing what I was told. I wanted to be a good worker. I'm not responsible, right? Um, so the tax collectors in India were in a very similar situation where they needed to produce this revenue. Um, and the report also suggested that both the officials and the subjects who were being tortured had all internalized the necessity of torture um, as something that was part of a successful participation in British bureaucracy. Um, so the commissioners wrote that the tax collector who tortured the most was deemed in public estimation the most efficient. While in contrast, anyone who exhibited a due regard for the persons of his fellow subjects was looked upon as incompetent. So it was sort of written into the community that if you were going to be good at your job as a tax collector, you had to torture so that you could be sure that you were getting the full amount of money um, out of these people. And if you weren't doing that, then clearly you were soft and you, know, you weren't quite good enough um, at getting it done. I mean, it was all kind of under the table, right? Like, um, 
they, they probably had people who knew what they were doing who would show new workers, but it wasn't like an official program. It was more casual than that. It would be like, here's some people who just came in, they didn't pay their taxes. Let's do something to them in the front of our, our place, like in the village square, so other people can see it happening. Or let's do it you know, in the shed behind our building. And until they pay, we'll just keep doing it. I guess what I'm asking is, do the people that are being, becoming the tax, the tax collectors, did they know they were going to be forced to torture people? I think so, yeah. That, or did they kind of figure it out on their own? Or they it was kind of an open secret in the community. Like, everyone knew that it was happening. Um, yeah. So if you got that job, I mean, it's a good job, right? Like, you're working for the British government. Um, and you could potentially advance if you did it well enough. So I feel it was, um, from what I've read, it seems like it was a kind of weighing the cost versus the, you know, the harm and being like, well, what else am I going to do? Sure, I'll make it happen. So yeah, I think they did now. Um, okay. Promotion, as I said. So, and this put them in this kind of position where they were, it's a catch-22, right? Because, of course, on the surface, the British can't be like, you have to torture to get this money. They have to be like, we would never allow people to torture. Um, and if we find out that you're doing it, you know, we're going to fire you. But these, these collectors would also get fired if they didn't produce the revenue. So they had to weigh, will I get caught or can I do this? And then, you know, they'll say, oh, you're doing your job. They'll kind of wink their eye, brush it under the carpet, let it go, right? Um, Maybe very much like in our own sort of era, right? If you think about Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib, um, this idea that like maybe everyone who's there knows that it's going on, but if it ever comes out in the public eye, right, then there's going to be hell to pay and someone's going to be fired for it um, or left holding the bag. Okay. So one way to think about this then um, is if we think about Stanley Milgram's experiments back, I think this was the 70s when he did this, um, and he came up with the idea of the agentic state. In his experiments, he had, uh, he had people come in and he told them, we're gonna be asking someone questions on the other side of the wall. Your job is to help us, there's a button. If they don't answer correctly, you need to push the button and they'll be shocked with an electric shock. If they continue to not answer as we want them to answer, you're going to keep pushing the button. It'll ramp up the juice, right? Like the, the electricity will get sort of more and more intense. And they had actors pretending that they were being shocked who would scream so that the person pushing the button would hear it. And these people just kept doing it. Like they just kept looking at, at the researchers and not seeing the researchers say stop. So they would just keep doing the job. So in this experiment, Milgram comes up with the idea of the agentic state to explain why that would be. Like, why, if you thought you were doing something that was really hurting someone on the other side of this wall, you would keep doing it. Um, and he said that, uh, essentially, a person sees himself as an agent for carrying out another person's wishes in this space. Um, and so the consequences of the shift is that you feel responsible to the authority that's directing you, but you don't feel responsibility for the content of what you're doing, for those actions. Um, and so in India, you have this kind of division of responsibility between the officials who are in charge and their assistants who are carrying out these orders. And this is a kind of similar ethical shift to what Milgram observed later in the 1970s. The assistants are doing their job to get the revenue collection, and that's their test of merit, right? Um, that's their sign of success. And the head tax collector doesn't watch it. He doesn't go, he's not a spectator at those acts. He just tells his assistants, you go get the money, and doesn't really want to see why, right? Leaves it up to them how they do it. So if you're an official, and this is how the system is set up, you can say, well, I didn't actually torture someone. I never told my worker to go torture. If they did that, that's on them. And if you're the assistant, you can say, I was told to get the money by whatever means, and I did what I had to do. So again, it's this sort of hierarchical system that allows for things like torture to happen because there's nobody who's going to be accountable, right? There's nobody left holding the bag if you have people sort of stepping back from it in this way at the same time. Um, and so you have a bureaucratic kind of chain of command, which modernizes this moment, as well as the fact that it's torture for money. And then the other reason why this is very different um, from forms of torture that have come in the past is because it was considered to be petty. So there's a lack of intensity that the British saw in what was happening in India that set it apart from that history that they knew with the rack and the other forms of torture. Um, and in the report, the commissioners did say, you know, the violence is usually of a petty kind, um, although it does cause acute momentary pain. And many of the officials in India also claimed that it could be called petty torture. So the word petty 
mitigates the force of the word torture, right? It makes it seem like it's really not that bad. And it also suggests that link back to petty commerce, to this idea that once more you've got violence in India that's linked to Britain's global commerce um, and producing money, right, um, for the British nation, for the modern British nation. So when British officials would call the torture petty, um, they're sort of willfully separating what they were uh, hearing about and what was happening from the idea of real torture, right? Like this isn't enough to be real torture. It's, you know, it's violence, but it doesn't really count um, enough to be like the traditional tortures that we think about. Um, so you have one tax collector who is British who said that it was an inconvenience that was caused by slightly beating people um, or abusing them and confining them, right? As if one can slightly beat someone um, <laughs> or abuse them in some way. Somebody else called it a system of bullying. Like they sort of dismissed it and downplayed it a little bit um, in their reports. And so what we have is the same thing that when we talk about tortures today, we would probably call enhanced interrogation techniques, right? Um, when you have a violence that somebody can call an inconvenience and somebody else can call torture, it falls in a kind of gray area. Um, and Rajali, who's uh, the political scientist I mentioned who works on torture, labels this clean techniques. So you've got people using everyday instruments that have been designed to do something else rather than a kind of rack or, you know, a, a torture instrument in and of itself. Um, and they don't leave a lot of marks on the body. So the effects are temporary and they're harder to prove. And in India in the 19th century, this meant that a lot of times there, there would be nothing done, right? Because if you don't have evidence on the body that you've been tortured, but you're saying that you are, who are people going to believe, right? The official or you? Uh, probably not you, um, in this case at least. So how did this look? Uh, what did they do? The tax collectors used their own bodies a lot of the time um, as the sort of most handy thing. They would slap or punch people. They would squeeze their crossed fingers um, as tightly as they could. They would pinch people's thighs or people's breasts really, really hard. They would twist people's ears. They would squeeze them by their testicles. They would drag them by their hair or their mustache. Sometimes they tied two people's hair together and like, um, I don't know, made them like run back and forth until they were exhausted. Um, and then sometimes they also use the victim's own bodies as uh, kind of passive instruments of torture. They would keep them stooping in the hot sun by tying them up in their own clothes, which we're going to talk about in a minute in a little bit more detail. They would stop them from eating or sleeping or going to the bathroom. So a lot of the techniques that we think about now when we think about enhanced interrogation um, were used at this time as well. Um, they also, um, in India, had natural objects that they could use, biting insects and red chili peppers. And they would put those in people's genitals, they would put them in their mouths um, as ways of, um, or even their nose, uh, of ways of getting them to, do, to produce money. Sometimes they would take like a half of a, a coconut shell and put it somewhere on the body with the insect inside, so it would just um, keep biting the people. So for the British, right, this isn't the rack. These aren't things that look like what they expected. But some of them did um, seem like they could be connected to the history that, that Britain had of torture. So in their efforts to make sense of what was going on and kind of properly categorize these unfamiliar acts of violence, the British focused a lot of the time on two very specific practices in India that they thought could make sense in relation to their own folklore. And those were called the kitty and a nun doll. Um, and so the British took the kitty and they drew a parallel from that to the thumb screws. And they took a nun doll and they set that up in comparison to what was called the scavenger's daughter. So I have a few images um, that will help with this. This is a picture of a thumb screw. Um, there's actually, I could never find a picture of a kitty anywhere, um, but it's a very simple device. The report described it as consisting of two sticks that were tied together at one end. And you put the fingers between those two sticks like you would, the report says a lemon squeezer. I think of a nutcracker, like a very simple nutcracker. Um, and you just squeeze as tight as you can. And so for the British, that sounded an awful lot like a thumb screw. And as you can see like in this image or behind me on that image, it's two metal plates and there are two screws. You put the thumbs or the fingers in between those two plates and then the torturer twists that little screw and the plates get closer and closer together until the ridges bore into the fingers and crush the bones, right? Um, as tightly as possible. So that was one thing where the British were like, okay, this looks like torture, right? Like this is something we recognize. And then the other thing was this practice of a nun doll. Um, and I actually just found this image desperately on the internet. I have no idea what these punishment cards were or who would collect punishment cards, um, but apparently that's a thing. Here's an example um, of a nun doll. 
And the report described this as tying a man down in a bent position by means of his own cloth or a rope of straw that gets passed over his neck and under his toes. And so they would do this and they would have somebody stand outside in the sun for hours at a time. And sometimes they would take a really large stone and put it on their back as well. So they would just be out there um, with a huge stone, like bent over in this position for hours, um, for a day, you know, whatever um, it was. And so for the British, this practice also made sense because they could connect it to the scavenger's daughter. So here is two examples of what the scavenger's daughter might have looked like um, in more medieval times. And if we think about the rack as something that would pull someone apart in four directions, the scavenger's daughter does exactly the opposite. It compresses your body and forces you to stay in that position. Um, so it, again, this idea of connecting the neck to the feet um, and leaving someone in that position for hours in a you know, sort of fetal and crouching eventually ends up crushing you. Blood starts to come out of your mouth, your nose, your ears, and you could end up dying. Um, so. The British press was very much into those two things, the kitty and a nun doll, because they were like, this looks like torture, we can make sense of it. Um, and the commissioners themselves also, when they were asking questions and kind of um, setting up their report, also really focused on torture instruments. Um, and so I have some other questions here that appeared when they were, they, they put up in their appendix, one of their appendixes in the report, they had a just the breakdown of a case where they had investigated a witness and a victim and they had questioned him. And they included their questions from this case. Um, the man's name was Guru Saab um, and he claimed that he'd been kept in a nundal for two hours and that he was also threatened with a large stone. And so the commissioner's questions for him were basically, you say you were threatened with a stone to be placed on your back. Was it put on your back? Regarding the stone you told me of, did you ever see it on anyone's back? Do you know any other man who's been punished with the stone? Do you know what the kitty is? Was it ever applied to you? Have you ever been punished with the kitty? So um, as I said, his case is really the only one that's detailed at length, like what happened when he came to talk to them um, in the whole report. And the book, <laughs> the report itself, like I actually had to have this airmailed to me from the British Library and it is a thousand pages, over a thousand pages of like four columns of text, like on each page. It's, I've never seen a larger book than this one. Um, and so in that whole book, this is the only case where they detail it with this, you know, level of these are the questions we ask this person. Um, all the other testimony from um, Indian witnesses is in the shape of sworn statements um, from people who are victims, from people who saw other people being tortured, or from the indigenous officials who are accused of doing the torturing. Um, and so uh, in just giving us this one case and showing the questions that they asked, um, it really shows how the commissioners are thinking about what the readers back in Britain who will see this report will make of it, right? So by focusing on that stone, by focusing on the kitty, um, they presented this case in a way that would show British readers how to make sense of it as torture. There are instruments that get used, right? It maybe isn't exactly like the instruments that we think of, but it's pretty close. Um, and here's how. Um, let's see, what else do I want to say about that? Okay, so they did that, but then they also, they sort of took it one step further, right? Um, they also said, Everybody in this debate has been thinking about instruments of torture. And look, we've showed you, there were some that were being used. But at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter. What matters is the amount of pain that gets produced when these things are done to these people. And you can produce the same amount of pain by squeezing someone's fingers as tight as you can with your own hand as you can if you're putting them in a thumb screw, right? And that is what we're looking at here. Um, so for them, whether it was a thumb screw, whether it was a kitty made of two sticks, or whether it was the tax collector's assistant squeezing as tight as he can or standing on someone's fingers, at the end of the day, it all counts. So therefore, let's stop bickering about whether or not this is torture and think about what we can do to stop it, right? Like, keep the focus, people. Like, they tried. Um, not that it worked, but they tried. And a lot of the journalists uh, back in Britain were like, no, that isn't going to work for us. It's not the same thing. So if you know the London Times, they had a lot to say about this. Um, and I have a quote for you up on there. One of the things that they said was that this torture that was happening in India wasn't torture of the high European sort, uh, which made a five feet man six feet or vice versa, which pressed him flat as a pancake or dropped water on him till he died. No, Indian torture is ready, impromptu, ingenious cheap, annoying, disgusting, revolting, and petty in the extreme. It's done with twisted sticks and heavy stones and the fibers of trees and chilies and red ants and burrowing worms and acrid juices. 
This is the whole apparatus of the Indian Inquisition, but it's made up by dexterity and promptness. So in this article, the Times essentially draws a kind of hierarchy, right, um, between traditional European forms of torture that had been used during the Inquisition and these practices of Indian tax officials. Um, and they really sort of look down their nose at the lack of ceremony um, that's happening in these modern updates to ancient torture practices in India. Um, using organic materials like chilies or like insects in place of these carefully constructed torture devices, you know, it's efficient, it's cost effective, sure, but it doesn't really produce that truly terrifying spectacle um, that you, you wanna see, or well, I guess some of them did wanna see, like when you're thinking about torture, right? Um, so you get a kind of ranking or a kind of class hierarchy structure, you know, like, yeah, you've got historically validated European forms of torture. This is a kind of impatient Indian upstart form. Um, it's just petty. It's never going to be awe-inspiring. And, you know, if it's convenient, that might be modern, but it makes it cheap, right? It makes it less. Um, so that was the times. But there were journals that kind of took a step back and, um, you know, were like, it doesn't matter if it's petty, it still counts. So you're not probably going to be able to read this because the print was very small, but this is from a satirical magazine called Punch, um, which was very popular in the 19th century. And I think of it a little bit like our onion, if you know the onion um, today. Um, it did a lot of similar work <laughs> in the culture. And so they set up their take on this as a kind of advertisement. It says the question as touching India, and then in parentheses underneath it says advertisement. So it's supposed to be from a firm, two merchants by the name of Wrench and Jives. And so the original meaning of the word torture was to wrench, um, and then the jives are the shackles. So right there, there's a joke. Um, and there's also a joke in the, the title, the question as touching India, um, because torture was often referred to as putting to the question. The Greek word for torture is bosanos um, in ancient times, and that just eventually came to mean the question, like as in, you know, the biggest and most awful question, because torture was used to extract truth from people, or allegedly to extract truth um, from people, that was the point. So Punch is relying on the reader's knowledge of this kind of history and this background to get the joke, even just going in, right, like into this, this little advertisement that they set up. Um, and once they've done that, they start out by talking about how the Indian question is twofold, extraordinary and ordinary. Um, so they're getting back to this issue of this public debate, right, that you've got extraordinary historical torture and petty ordinary torture torture. Um, and then it goes on to talk a little bit about the different updated modern torture instruments that this firm has to offer. And one of which, if you'll see, like uh, second to last is the scavenger's younger daughter. So again, this is the original scavenger's daughter. Um, you know, the fetal position and all of that. The advertisement claims that their scavenger's younger daughter is a modern update on this machine, right? The ancient invention for the infliction of suffering. And it's designed to save a torturer time and trouble, right? Like, you got to get your job done. You want to get it done quick. We've got a machine for you that updates this whole process. But it's not, they don't talk about it as if it's updating the original scavenger's daughter. Instead, they talk about it as an update to the practice of hauling somebody up a tree with their arms tied behind their back and beating them with sticks on the shin, which is something that would have happened in India, right? Um, so they construct this whole history of the sort of petty, modern, cheap torture in India um, in comparison to the original scavenger's daughter as something that can be updated and even more modernized um, than it already is, right? Um, you know, again, getting back at this point that no matter how you're doing it, uh, no matter how efficient it is, no matter how much it looks like the past, it produces the same result on the human body. Um, so they did that by means, as I said, of a kind of satirical ad, rather than having an article with someone being very kind of indignant and self-righteous. Um, but at the end of the day, right, for them and for a lot of the people who were in this debate, pain ends up being pain. Um, so on that note, right, we've talked a little bit about the forms and the definition of torture, how that evolved. And I want to talk a little bit about those effects, right? Like, why does it matter? Part of why I think it's important is because, um, you know, it's this moment where when we think about torture, pain becomes that key element. It becomes what we use to think about why and how we define torture. Um, and while some of the British officials who responded to the commissioners and reported what they saw happening in their districts um, did not acknowledge that, this is a moment where for the first time some people did. Some people did say, you know, what happens to the body is what really matters. Um, 
And so J.J. Minchin was a tax collector. Um, he was British, and he wrote in, and he said he had no hesitation in labeling a nun doll as torture because he was considering the heat of the Indian sun, the manner in which the blood must flow to the head in such a posture, and the weight of the stone which gets placed on the settler, or the settler, sorry, the sufferer's back. Um, so he's, he's, you know, basically said, we have to weigh what happens to this body and how the differences in climate from Britain, um, you know, how these things uh, matter how we take them into account while we're defining torture. There's a material experience that somebody who undergoes this process feels, um, and that might be different from what we think we know about torture and what torture looks like, but that's what we have to take into account. Um, it doesn't matter if it doesn't fit our tradition. Think about what would happen to someone's body in this position, um, and then you'll know. He was a tax collector. The report also asked medical professionals in India who had often been called to examine bodies um, of people who said they'd been tortured to report. And you get a little bit of a different uh, take from some of these doctors. Um, and again, as I said, when the officials would do these techniques, a lot of times they didn't leave marks for a very long time because it was a clean technique um, that caused a lot of pain in the moment but went away quickly. And they also sometimes kept people locked up and didn't send them to the doctor until it had already passed, right? Like if there was a mark, it would, it would heal or it would go away. Um, so as a result, you have a lot of doctors who are writing back that, you know, they don't see any torture. Um, there's no marked bodies. Uh, there's no evidence. And Surgeon McNeil or Dr. McNeil is one of those people. Um, and he wrote that he'd seen professionally many thousands of the natives of this district, and not a single case of torture had come to his notice. So. When he writes this in to the, the commissioners, he's stressing his own professional gaze and his own medical authority, right? He has the t statistics to back up his case. He's a professional who's looked at thousands of bodies. He's never seen, you know, one piece of tangible evidence. Therefore, he can, you know, confidently say this does not happen. Um, so in this moment, when you see these medical people weighing in on torture, um, what they're doing or the way that they're constructing this narrative really fits in with what was happening to medicine in the 19th century um, as well. So back in Britain, you're getting this kind of bureaucratic hospital medicine where it's no longer about like what a person is saying to the doctor, much like I'm sure a lot of us experience sometimes now when we go to the doctor, it's about what they see on your body. As an expert, um, you know, the, the doctor takes that authority on themselves and uh, doesn't really pay attention necessarily to what the person um, is saying. So the same thing happens with these torture victims. This is another surgeon, um, and he really goes to town with this idea of bureaucracy and protocol and about how you can use that to figure things out. So he talks about how every time he examines and expects the prisoner, they're wholly clothesless, they don't wear any clothes, he expects their whole body, inspects it, and then he registers and records anything about them um, on various forms keeps the forms, has information about every prisoner that's exactly the same. So their criminal number, their height, um, whether or not they'd been vaccinated, um, whether or not they had small packs, how old they were. Um, he basically collects the same information for each person that comes through and sees him. So in doing that, he's emphasizing his own conformity to a bureaucratic ritual um, and the sort of systematic and standardized information that he collects, right, in that ritual. Um, he doesn't see them as individual people. Um, or how these stories actually play out, so much as, a, again, a collection of statistics and just everything's kind of the same. Um, and again, this gets back to that issue of medical authority um, and reading a body as a kind of fragment, right? Like, well, this arm looks like this, this leg looks like this. Not, here's a person sitting in front of me telling me this thing about their experience. Um, people began to be seen as a kind of, a, an instance of disease or a collection of symptoms rather than an individual. All right, so now we have Dr. Fletcher. I think he's my last surgeon. Um, and I, I bring up a couple of examples of him to just kind of show the ways in which when the doctors were writing about what they saw, um, it becomes a kind of fragmented narrative um, in the same way that a person who's being tortured, the torturer sees their victim as a, a fragment of a human body, right? Like, how can I work on these fingers? How can I work on this leg? What can I do to this body part to produce what it is that I want? So the, the victims have this experience of not being seen as whole people, but just kind of a collection of stuff to produce money when they get tortured. Then when they go see the doctor to sort of make the claim that they had been tortured, they experience the same kind of fragmentation of their body from the doctor who's reporting on what they see. So he talks about uh, meeting this prisoner 
Um, and he says, I carefully examined him, and he's got the following marks of maltreatment. From wrist to upper third of both forearms, there are distinct marks of tight ligatures. On right wrist, the skin is abraded in two places. Um, there's also slight abrasion of the skin on right shoulder and chest. So um, he's got this choppy prose style that's like a personal note to himself. It's not even like a full sentence constructing, you know, a, a story, right, about what happened to this person who comes and sees him. So even when he does bring in the testimony from the victim, um, he does so, again, in, in reference to fragments of the body, and he doesn't put together a narrative of, of the event. So here he's got a statement about another prisoner, Ramasamy, who complains of pain and swelling of hands and knees, caused, as he states, by having been beaten with a stick, and which from the state of the parts, I believe to be true. So you can see here, uh, I've broken down the sentence for you, the ways in which uh, he sets it up um, there's two sides to this sentence, or two parts, divided by the word and. And the first part of it is what the patient has to say. He complained, um, and he states, right, that this is why he complained, um, why he got the pain, was being beaten by a stick. Then he separates it, and then on the other side of the sentence, he talks about the body parts, his own expertise, and the truth. So he already separates this man, you know, um, from those things, from the truth, and just relies kind of on the fragmented body that he is looking at as the expert rather than listening to what the person is saying. Um, okay, how are we doing on time? Um, okay, so essentially this torture is supposed to demonstrate subjects' loyalty to the state, right? Not because of any kind of, I believe the king is the king, or I believe this religion is the right religion, the way that it was in the past, by paying taxes, right? I'm loyal to the state, I pay my taxes, my body is compliant um, in a practical way. Um, so this means that when torture victims get silenced in India, it's for a different reason than they were silenced in Europe, right? During the sort of traditional European tortures of the Middle Ages, it was about replacing the victim's voice with the spectacle of what was happening to their body to demonstrate that the sovereign was in charge. Uh, in India, you get people doing torturing who don't want you to scream because, you know, they don't want to, to be, like, out in the public space. Um, so a lot of the victims testified that their voices got silenced. Um, one man told the commissioners that when he cried out while being beaten um, with a belt, his torturer hit him four more times and told him not to make a noise. Um, and a lot of them said, you know, these kinds of rhetorical questions about not being able to tell anyone what had happened to them. So you can see here, to whom can I complain? What is the use of a poor man like me complaining? I didn't complain, for who will hear, right? Um, but when they're telling the commissioners who have actually been sent to listen these rhetorical questions and why they never came forward at the time that the torture was happening, um, these victims are managing to kind of indict the government for dismissing them without accusing the government of anything, right? It's a rhetorical question that makes a point. Um, nobody's there to help me without saying, why wasn't anyone there to help me? I'm really mad about it, right? It's just like, well, I didn't do anything because nothing would have happened. Um, so it was a way for them to kind of assert their voice in that moment um, and say what they needed to say without having to fear retribution. Um, and they could also use their own bodies um, to kind of tell their story when they came in front of the commissioners. Um, and so I want to show you, I have a slide for this, a female victim, uh, I hope you can read it, I guess the print's kind of small, um, who came up and she told her story to the commissioners with the help of a commissioner. Um, and she attempted to humanize herself through her experience as she's giving them her narrative choices and, and telling them what happened to her. So she says, you know, after my husband's death, I have this relation, Chengal Reddy, and he bribed officials to steal our land and he told the tax collectors a lie about my kid, right? about my son. So as a result, the tax collectors took her son away. He disappeared. She got a tip from some other villagers on where he might be, and she heard him calling out mama and papa. Um, and so she followed that sound to where the tax collectors were beating him. She approached, she tried to intercede. Um, and then one of the tax collectors punched her in the nose with his fist and made it bleed. And then she looked around to see her son after that happened, and he struck her again on the chest with a stick which had an iron for rule, and so she falls down senseless, she tells the commissioners, and then the tax collectors take her, they put her in jail, um, and the next day they let her go and she's crying and beating her mouth, um, which is something that people would do in this situation. So she uses this moment where she's telling the story of what happened um, with her son and kind of uh, what she did in reaction to that to position herself as a unique individual. Um, she's having this particular and specific experience um, 
as an individual woman, but she's also a member of a community. She's a widow, she's a mother, she's trying to protect her son, right? Um, therefore, she's demonstrating, I have an important place in other people's lives. Um, and so by doing that, she's reaching out, not just to the commissioners, but to the kind of British readers who uh, would hear about this in the report um, to make a case for herself um, as somebody who's deserving of human dignity, right? Um, a sociologist named Mimi Scheller suggests that to make claims as a free citizen, uh, political subjects have to first position themselves, and they have to do that in relation to race, gender, nation, and sexual uh, sexuality. Um, and by setting themselves up within these very specific categories, by making known how they fit into those categories, um, they can also make the case that they are a better fit as a citizen than people who don't fit into those categories, right? So for Subaka, she's setting herself up when she's telling this story as an individual subject. She's setting herself up as a heterosexual Indian woman, right? She's accounting for her sexuality, her race, and her gender. And she's asserting her own right to fair treatment because she's performing as a good member of the community. She's a good mother. She's a widow. Um, unlike this male relation of hers who stole land and like tried to screw over his own relatives, right? Um, she's performing femininity. She's performing womanhood in a way that was respectable. Um, she did get married before she had her son, which not everyone did in India at this time. You know, she's taking care of her kid. Um, so the British readers, particularly British mothers, could recognize that and therefore recognize her as a person who's entitled to be treated with with dignity and with equality. Um, and so in a weird way, right, like the torture gives her um, a kind of position from which to make this case or to make this argument um, to, for her own uh, bodily integrity. Okay. So in this moment, um, troubling the definitions of torture and what it means to be a modern and a civilized government, this torture scandal illuminates the confused status of Indian citizen subjects in the British Empire, right? They're not enemies of the state. Um, India has already had Britain kind of take it over and they're subjects of the queen, um, but they're not legal citizens either. So they're in this kind of like weird in-between place, um, although in fact, technically nobody could really be a citizen at this time because you have a ruler, right? So you're a subject. You're not necessarily a citizen in the same way um, because you're subject to whatever that ruler decides ultimately. Um, but some scholars have shown that thinking about your allegiance to the ruler, your allegiance to the crown and your demonstration of that as a defining characteristic of what it means to be a good British subject actually ends up legitimating your demand for citizenship at the same time. So in other words, um, if I'm being good, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, then I get rewarded. The sovereign protects me. And the way that the sovereign can protect me is by giving me these rights, right, within the frame of the nation or within the situation. Even though I'm not technically really a citizen, um, it's a kind of a form of reward for being good, um, doing what I'm supposed to do. So the torture works in a weird way to expand that category for Indian subjects because who pays taxes? Citizens pay taxes. Right? So if you're asking me to pay taxes, if I have that responsibility, then I should have the rights that go along with it. Um, you're treating me as if I should be contributing to this state and to this nation. Um, you owe me something back, right? Um, so even though technically like nobody in India could be like a legal citizen at this time, it opens up the possibility for that, um, to start asking those questions and start thinking about what it means um, to do what the state or what the nation requires and what you should be getting back um, in return for that. Um, okay, and I mean, I think, again, like this is also very similar. It's very similar to our own situation, right? We have 65 million people who are refugees who are not part of a state or part of a nation. So we always talk about human rights, right? And that if you're a human, you should have equal rights and everything should be fine. But when the chips are down and push comes to shove, those don't really mean anything. Um, unless you're attached to some kind of nation or some kind of state that will give you something, um, it doesn't matter if you're human. You'll be living in a tent, you know, just outside the Syrian border. No one cares. Um, I mean, people care, but you get what I'm saying. Um, and Hannah Arendt, uh, the woman who talked about the banality of evil, talked about this as well um, and wrote about how the world in the 19th century didn't really see anything sacred in just being human, right? Like, at the end of the day, that doesn't necessarily matter. Um, even though we think it does and we talk about how it does, you really have to have a government that's willing to give you uh, the rights or the, 
dignity of being human for that to count. And that often happens in the shape of citizenship. So then this moment, again, this, this moment of torture, this moment of scandal, allowed for a closer examination um, of those issues and helped bring to light a more universal understanding of the extremity of pain. Um, it broadened the British understanding of what makes torture what it is. Um, and the British responses um, to this report and the depictions of suffering um, helped transform a victim definition of torture into a shared language and begin to realign the way that we think about suffering um, and how we depict suffering in a more modern way in the world, right? Um, and it did that because it really sort of got into people's heads. Um, when you're reading about these things happening in the newspapers didn't hold back. They, they just said, you know, these are the things that happened, you know. Um, this person had a chili pepper stuck in their genitals and like, you know, they just really, <laughs> there was no censorship essentially. Um, so as a reader, this is a moment where you could read that and you could imagine it and it would provoke a kind of visceral reaction. Your body even would just kind of recoil, right? Like imagining it happening to you. Um, and by presenting that kind of graphic suffering over and over again, both in the report itself and then the press that copied the report, um, it helps to expand how we define suffering um, and help Britain to think about it in new ways, right? Like, as well as torture, um, like what it means to be a victim, what it means to be someone who's subjected to pain. Um, and also helps start to reshape, as I said, the ways in which uh, they thought about social relationships and citizenship in these spaces and also changed the way Britain thought about themselves, at least for some British people. As always, even as today, right, some people are going to be concerned with uh, things that come to light and some people aren't in a nation. And so I have a couple of quotes for you here to wind down that are about um, the journals and what they thought and said. So the Edinburgh Review said that as long as this remains unredressed through our guilty inactivity, right, through Britons, citizens, or people in Britain, their guilty inactivity, so long will every stroke of the lash, every turn of the thumbscrew, and every more loathsome and revolting indignity throughout the length and breadth of India be added to the catalog of Britain's own national responsibilities. So even in the way that the, the author of this article writes, um, they produce a kind of rhythm in their prose um, that mimics the rise and fall of like a torture who's whipping, right? As long, so long, every stroke, every turn. That mechanical rhythm is present in the language itself um, in the same way that you would see it in someone who's whipping or somebody who's turning a thumbscrew repeatedly, right? Getting at the fact that we as readers are complicit if we don't do anything um, now that we know that this is happening. Um, and here are a couple of other journals, the Morning Post and the Essex Standard, who weighed in on this as well. Um, and the Morning Post basically said, you know, our hypocrisy in claiming this kind of global leadership um, for modern civilization has been exposed here. Like, we are responsible to the civilized world for the thing that is happening in India. It's on us, right? Um, and the Essex Standard, which is also on the slide, took this to the international stage. So again, if, we're, if Britain is a nation that's thinking about how much better they are than everyone else in sight, how much more humane, how terrible Russia is for doing these awful things, and very smug about it, right, like in the national space, um, what do you do when this report comes out and it turns out that you were doing the same stuff, maybe even worse, right? Um, your glory's tarnished by the publication of this. Um, more so than by anything else that's happened in the past. And Lord knows it was a very checkered history, even before this point, for Britain. Um, although they like to try to forget, right, like the horrible things that they've done. Um, so some people did take it very seriously um, as a horrible thing. And it really demonstrated uh, the ways in which torture could become a kind of new marker of modernity. So on the slide there um, is the Radical Reynolds newspaper. Um, and Reynolds was pretty liberal, radical liberal, in fact, and wrote that even though it seems monstrous that a modern British government could emulate the deeds of those monsters of a past age who presided over the fiend-like atrocities of the rack, the thumbscrew, or the question by water, this report had proved conclusively that it was under the rule of Englishmen, with their sanction, with their connivance, and according to Anglo-Indian law, that torture had happened in India. So if you think about that British folklore of torture that they kept returning to, Remember, that sort of accounts for it as something that happens outside the realm of law. It doesn't take place as part of normal, everyday life. Um, and for Reynolds' newspaper, right, the torture report proved that it was exactly the opposite. Torture was fully a part of the ways in which Britain enforced its tax laws. It was sort of hand in glove, right, like with the law at this time. 
So it becomes a kind of banal or everyday form of state control um, and therefore also helps establish this moment where state terrorism um, becomes foundational to modernity. Um, it becomes a tool of a state to secure the global hegemony of the liberal capitalist West um, and shows Britain, right, like this is, this is what you've done. This is the foundation of your so-called modern civilization and imperial rule. Um, and actually, uh, the historian Pankaj Mishra has written about this most recently in a book called The Age of Anger, History of the Present, um, the ways in which the kind of anger um, that we see now in our own modern world and the people all over the world who aren't quite ready to, or who can't partake of it in the same way that they would like to, is actually just a reiteration of what happened um, in Europe and the West in this way, where uh, Western nations who were um, colonizing and kind of uh, trying to force modernity and everything in sight, um, covered over or refused to acknowledge the way in which they got there, right? How do we get to modernity? We get there by enslaving people, killing off other people, taking their land, making room for our capitalist space and for um, our imperial dreams and goals. Um, so yeah, that's really all. That's really all I have. It's a kind of a dismal note to end on, but <laughs> such it is, right? Like you knew you were coming here for torture, so <laughs> you probably expected it to be a little dismal. Does anybody have any extra questions or anything uh, you want to talk about? So James Comey, the FBI director, mm -hmm. said in his book that the torture did work and that we knew it for a long time. Is that true? I mean, other experts would say no, it doesn't work because everybody gets to a point where they're gonna break, right? And they will tell you whatever you think, uh, whatever they think you wanna hear to get out of that situation. So what it does is it produces, it produces confessions, people will tell you stuff, but it doesn't make it true, right? It's just, they'll, they'll get what they can. They would give you some money, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess money is something you can't really lie about, isn't it? Like, it is there or it's not. It's not like saying, yeah, I know where some terrorist act is going to go down, and I can tell you about it if you stop torturing me. Yeah. Have you heard the, about the, the, the NPR uh, piece of the, the, the dark side of empathy? Oh, I just saved that. I haven't read it yet. I just saw it. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a new book coming out from the University Press. Mm -hmm. the, the idea behind that is that um, back in, I think, back in like the 70s, psychologists thought, well, the world would be such a, a better place mm -hmm. if everybody could have empathy for others and see us as all, you know, fellow humans. Yeah. And that the, the tests that they've been doing on rates of empathy have gone down, 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 down since then. Mm -hmm. And what, what they figured out is, well, it's actually changed now to where it's considered acceptable to have empathy for your in-group. Mm -hmm. The people you feel a part of. And and that allows you to do anything you want to to the out-group. Mm -hmm. Because you have no empathy for them. But when you look at like like, like Guantanamo and mm -hmm. Abu Ghraib, the torture that was carried out in the name of the United States there gives terrorists an excuse mm -hmm. to maim and kill Americans. It's us versus them, yeah. Like yeah, so they they, mm -hmm. have, they have so much empathy for their in group, mm -hmm. for their people that mm -hmm. you know it, it turns into violence. And it's interesting because I think. Um, people say now or think about the ways in which social media contributes to that, that you're able to limit yourself to a surrounding cloud or a bubble of people that are just like you and sort of it's an echo chamber of everybody thinking and saying the same things. And so we don't have the kinds of dialogue or conversations with people that are different from us in the way that you used to have to. Um, and certainly my own daughter, like a lot of young people don't ever even leave their house, right? <laughs> They're just like in the, in the room, on the phone, like doing, doing whatever it is that they do with people that they are already friends with. Um, and so I think, yeah, like that idea of we're losing empathy for people who aren't like us um, is partially tied to that as well in interesting ways. Um, we always say, like, as when we teach literature, right, like if you read about people whose experiences are different than yours um, regularly, that actually studies have been done that say that that helps with empathy. It helps you to start understanding that uh, just because it's not an experience that you've had um, doesn't make it valid um, and what that might feel like for somebody else. So, yeah. The other point I thought was really interesting, 
Mm -hmm. And and you know people yeah. have been talking about Trump as a bully. Mm -hmm. And just the other day that conversation has now evolved to Trump as a social man, mm. which is a totally that's a pretty big claim, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's taking bullying yeah, mm -hmm. and expanding it to society instead of individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, Pat. I mean, when you said that, I, I, I was thinking along the line of what is modern day torture mm -hmm. in terms of um, bullying, um, child abuse, mm -hmm. you know, all the, I mean, we hear more about it perhaps now because of social media. Yeah. Um, but these things have been happening, but they seem to be happening more often mm -hmm. or reported. Um, so what is an official uh, version of torture? I mean, <laughs> there are many definitions of it. Um, and this actually is the problem why I started to write this book, because scholars would, would say things like, well, in the 19th century, you have sort of two related problems. Number one state torture stops happening. Number two, people use the word torture to talk about everything and it loses all meaning or any significance because if you can be like, oh, I have a headache, I'm so tortured today, that it doesn't actually hold any real content, right? Um, so, I mean, for my purposes in this book, I think of it as a, um, a tool that produces a kind of extreme duress, either physically or mentally, in order to uh, elicit something from someone, right? So um, in another chapter of this text, I think about it in relationship to marriage. Um, and in the 19th century, as you start to have women agitating for more rights within marriages, um, there's a whole trend in literature where men start torturing them in the home in various psychological ways. Um, and that, that definition expands um, to consider psychological cruelty as a form of torture that should be held accountable. Um, but the reason why these men are doing it is because they want to reassert power, right? They want to have that position of like absolute sovereignty in their home that they used to have, and they want to demand that their wife give that to them. So they're trying to get her to submit um, and to produce something that demonstrates that submission. You can see the same thing when you think about somebody doing it in a state, right? You're always, if you're using torture, you're always doing it to get something out of either that person or other people who are witnessing what's happening. Um, if it's, uh, you know, something that happens publicly or if other people hear about it, they'll know that they have to behave a certain way so that it doesn't happen to them. Um, or you can get them to produce the confession, possibly money, right? Um, you, you're trying to get something. It's not just to do it because you like it. It's not because you're a sadist. You're, there's a reason, right? for it to count as torture. It has to be something um, that evokes something from the victim and from people who might be watching. So, so you think that separating the children from, from the parents and the, for the migrants is a form of torture? It could be. I mean, certainly it sounds like those children were sexually abused as well, a lot of them. And, you know, like there were things that were happening um, within that space, even outside of that separation. But if you're using the separation as a tool um, to force someone to do something or not do something, right, to go away, don't come here. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a tool of domestic violence. I, I volunteer, uh, I've been an advocate for a long time at a, a domestic violence and sexual assault institutions, and um, that's actually a very well-known technique for domestic abusers to separate someone from their children um, as a way to make them fall in line and do what they're supposed to do. So you could make that argument, I think. And there's yeah. a public aspect of how people under the bridge for a couple of nights Mm -hmm. for yeah. Yeah, and that's interesting. I mean, if we think about President Trump, that's interesting too, because not to say that he's a torturer, but just in terms of like making examples and whether or not he's thinking consciously about what he's doing and he's doing it deliberately, or he is, you know, is he a sociopath who just can't control himself? Like, I don't, I don't know. For my purposes in this, I wouldn't. But I mean, again, like some people, some people probably would. Yeah, like um, 
There are, I mean, if you even, this was actually a huge problem when I was starting this project because there are so many different ways that people kind of categorize and define it um, that I do think you could find some people who would say absolutely, right? Like, um, in terms of this project and what I'm trying to do, I'm thinking about it very specifically in relation to the state and kind of that old form and, uh, and, and its relation to terrorism, um, to state terrorism. Like, the word terrorism comes about during the French Revolution as a word to describe what the government is doing, right? Like, it isn't about some outsider who's attacking citizens of the state. It's the state itself systematically doing something to make its citizens behave. Um, and so I'm thinking about it in that way for my project, but I would definitely say there are people who would think about a serial killer who, say, like, flays someone or, you know, like, does something to them in that respect, would, would perhaps categorize it in that way. Um, what got you, I'm always curious as to how people get off of these certain projects. What got you interested yeah. in this topic? Because it's very unique. Um, well, actually, I come to it from a position of interest in thinking about sadomasochism in my work and thinking about um, just in relation to sort of sexuality and how that manifests in texts. Um, and uh, it sort of took a turn when I was in grad school and uh, into this sort of more interest in kind of thinking about the government. And I was always interested in questions of empire and kind of the ways it's very specific. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the India in the 1850s. Mm -hmm. I mean, the British had colonies all the world. Oh, the book does more yeah, than I'm this. Sure. Yeah, this is from one chapter. Yeah. 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 So I was just, you know, why was the focus on India? That was this is actually the nubbin of the project. When I started looking for my dissertation, when it was a dissertation, I uh, went into a periodicals database of like British periodicals in the 19th century and did a search, right, for the word torture to kind of see what would come up. And um, a lot of stuff came up about this report, which I hadn't known about really. I mean, a couple of people have written on it in the past. Like I can think of literally three scholars from different fields who ever talked about this report and that's it um nobody that i knew knew about it so that caught my attention and i started researching it and from that i was able to build out so the the book as a whole also talks about um martyr novels and like the idea of torture in the religious rights context um, in britain itself um, it talks about as i said marriages and that's in britain itself too and then i also have a chapter on jamaica and kind of what happened there uh, after slavery in relationship to torture and martial law um, and a chapter on south africa and the pacific in which you see in literature um, these stories about white european settlers in these spaces who start taking this idea of torture and practicing it themselves right like what the state is doing they take it and in those colonial spaces in south africa like where you have settlers um, they use it to kind of um, reduce resistance from indigenous people who are living there already so the book itself covers um, various countries and spaces and more time it covers from like the 1850s to probably about 1915 or 1920. i haven't decided like where i'm going to cut it <laughs> it's hard but this was the, the sort of heart um, it's interesting, I don't know if that came in your research, but in the same time period, like in India, mm -hmm. one form of torture was um, also female, you know, females who had lost husbands, they were widows, mm -hmm. and they had to live under certain restricted mm -hmm. rules. Yeah. But if they didn't follow that rule, uh, sometimes the form of torture was cutting their hair in front of people. Oh, I don't think I've heard of that. You always hear about the kind of widow burning, like the British were very big. I'm like, oh, it's horrible. We have to save these women, you know, um, and use it as an excuse, right, to kind of come in and do whatever. Um, the same way if you think about Afghanistan now, right? Like we must protect the women, only it matters. But um, yeah, I didn't know that about the hair cutting. That's interesting. That would be, hair cutting would be almost more like the psychological torture. It's a psychological yeah, like a kind of shaming, shaming you, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Women who collaborated with the other, mm -hmm. especially if they had sexual relations. Yeah, they did that to the French. Right. You know, especially the French women that collaborated with the authors. Yeah. So I, I think in the British era, then in the 19th century, you know. Well, I guess the women started their barbers who were cutting the hair. Mm. In the village, you would have one barber, and that's, mm -hmm. that's where everybody goes. So if the barber says, no, I'm not cutting the hair anymore, then you don't have any choice. Mm -hmm. You're not going to cut the hair. Mm, so the barbers kind of formed a committee or a group 
that's like, ah, no, from now We're going to take a stand, you know, yeah. We're not going to, you know, and for women right, and not have this torture mm. on the widows. Yeah. Hmm. An example of people power, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that reminds me of Jamaica, actually, because in Jamaica, they claimed there was a, a tiny rebellion, and then the, the military kind of came in and just started, like, indiscriminately doing things to everybody who was, you know, who was a black Jamaican on site, basically. If you were black and you were there, you were on the hook to possibly be tortured. And they, they shaved heads, um, and they had people, I think they had just butchers, this is one of the words, that, or one of the, the professions, who had to do the torturing for them. So they just whipped people. They would give them like 100 lashes or 150 lashes for rebelling um, without even a trial. And they had these people who were just there to do it. And uh, there was documentation of one man whose wife would talk about how he would come home and just be like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I have to say no, because it was affecting him physically and mentally, as well as the people that he was doing it to. And so he also was like, I can't do it. So that's interesting to think about. Like somebody who doesn't seem like they have any power, but how they can in that moment, like, take a stand. One thing you didn't cover, and I also missed it, is the deterrence aspect of this. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the punishment, you know, the, the torture. Was that, was that public at all? It varied. Were people watching this? Because, deter you, know, mm -hmm. you know, public execution, there's a reason, you know. Right, to make other people to, do. To deter people. If you're punishing someone and no one else sees it, or right. them, then what good does it do? You know, right. In a way, yeah. If you want to yeah. A lot of times, it's dicey because on the one hand, technically they weren't supposed to be doing it. So there was always that kind of little game, but they did stand people up. Like when they put them in a nundal, a lot of times they would have them stand up in a public place in front of people. So like if you would be going into the town and kind of going about your business, you would see these people who are just standing there for hours with a stone on their back in this kind of crouched position. When it was, um, when it was more sort of sexual in nature, right? Like one instance that I read about, a man said that he had been raped with a broken, like a stick. Um, that was done privately, so there was no witnesses. So it kind of, I think, varied based on where in the Madras presidency it was happening and uh, what the practice was that they were doing in that moment. Because the idea was to get them to pay taxes, right? Yes. So it would seem to me that something like that should be public. Mm -hmm. so well, people yeah. people see this is what happens if you don't pay your taxes. That's just my way of looking at it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And that's what the Anandal was for. I mean, certainly if you had somebody being raped with an object in a shed, word would get out, right, to other people, even if you didn't see it. So, like, that person would then tell their family, like, you know, if they made it home before they died, and, like, word would spread and people would know. Um, but, yeah, like, the sort of less, the less sexual practices often did get set up in public spaces but yeah, so deliberately. Like she said, if it's illegal... Right. Then you don't want people. Right. So right. But I think the shaving of the head was definitely in public. Mm -hmm. People yeah. were in the middle of a town, and all the towns that everybody's gathered, and you know, they're shaving the head of the Yeah. Head. And others would learn from it, or the widows would learn, saying, I, I better not do what she did. Yeah. So we're all in the same condition. So the bottom line is that the British said this doesn't happen. Always. Because the fourth came out and says, yes, it does. Yep. So they went to investigate. Mm -hmm. They found out that yes, it does. That's basically the gist of, um, yeah. of this whole thing. Like a the member of parliament, his name is Danby, Danby Seymour, he had heard something about it because this wasn't the first time that it had been brought up either. Like, um, even as early as the 1830s, the East India Company in Britain was getting these reports and kind of ignoring them. So this member of parliament heard something about it, and he actually traveled to India to check it out himself. Um, and he met people who t said, this is what happened to me. And they showed him like illustrations of what had happened. And he came back and made a big stink, essentially, in parliament and was like, we need to do something about this. And at that point, the government was like, OK, yeah, we need to do something about it. Everybody knows it's public in Britain. People are having concerns and being irritated. Um, with us, uh, so we'll send people to go look and see what happened. Yeah. Arguably, this is kind of a side tangent, but arguably why in the 1850s it becomes possible for them to send people, why they suddenly start caring, is in part because at the same time you have the Crimean War happening, and that's sort of considered to be one of the most modern, or like the first modern war because of um, technology that was being used and photographs and trains and you know all of that. Um, but the government was considered to be, 
really ineffective. Like the officials of the British government, the British army in the Crimea were really getting a lot of attack from, from Britain, from the citizens, because they weren't doing a good job. And so um, this was another example of how the government was messing up, that people latched onto. So it became, well, yes, the government sucks in the Crimea. Maybe we suck here too. Let's go check it out, you know, and see, you know, get those middle class good values. Um, in, in, the, in the military and in, in Britain, or I'm sorry, in India and in the Crimea as well. Yeah. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Other interesting forms of torture that you've heard or know about and want to tell me? Like <laughs> this jumps back a little bit to what we were talking about hmm. earlier, but hmm. so, I mean, one of the things you've been talking about here is how they sort of had to readjust what they thought their definition of yeah. torture was. But you were also talking about how the word terrorism sort of arose during the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Have you yourself noticed any ways that we've maybe altered our definition of terrorism since its original use? Yeah, and I mean, in the 19th century, um, in Jamaica, actually, there was a lawyer who wrote about what the military was doing as terrorism as well, back to this idea of like the government being in charge and doing things under martial law that they're not supposed to be doing. Um, but uh, Amy Martin has a book on terrorism in the 19th century that looks at the ways that it shifts, um, the ways in which government starts doing what our own government does now and calling their efforts counter-terrorism, right? Like there's this horrible thing. We have a state of emergency because there are terrorists out there who are coming to get us. Um, we have to have a war on terror. Anything that we have to, if we have to torture people in Abu Ghraib, we have to torture them because, um, you know, we have to stop it from happening. Um, so very similar to that, if you think about the Irish, um, the rebels in Ireland, um, and they would, like, toward the end of the century, they would, uh, they would have bombs in public spaces. And so that became a kind of uh, one of the points that uh, the British government focused on and started calling that terrorism and thinking about it being, like, individual actors who are doing things against the state rather than as a tool that the state is using to control people. So yeah, that was the moment where it, it sort of began to shift into what we think about it as terrorism now. Wouldn't it be a little bit like what you said earlier, you know when you see it? Yeah, there is that, right? Like, scholars them. argue about these terms like relentlessly, but you know, you know when you see. Yeah. Yep. You know, because it conveys the idea of you creating the stress and pain mm -hmm. because I can't have it. Um, and I'm thinking if you were to put the word torture in various categories, mm -hmm. it could be endless. Mm -hmm. You know, in how we define yeah. the word torture and, um, and how the meaning, and I'm thinking of it from the museum. Mm -hmm. how language is always changing yeah. and you go from syntax to semantics you mm -hmm. know, and, and you get something different. It depends on which category you are in trying to yep. discuss the word torture. So I can see that as being a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating, really, to think about, like, sort of how it's evolved and what we use it for, you know, now, and how we argue, you know, is waterboarding, is it torture, is it not torture? Like, it's still the same. Like, people still can't all agree. Um, yeah. I mean, I know one form of torture in ancient India, especially by the Maharajas, uh, was putting somebody in a very dark room. There's mm -hmm. absolutely no light, and you are locking them into complete darkness mm -hmm. for a very, very long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they did that in Rome too um, in their empire they would have like a kind of pit that they would sometimes lower people into that was completely dark for solitary confinement as well yeah so we're very creative at hurting each other <laughs> humans find lots of different ways to do it yeah okay well I guess um, we're done I think you can say this is going to be very interesting presentation a lot of good feedback yeah thank you all so much for coming and yeah like sharing your thoughts with me it's helpful <laughs>